Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the fourth presentation of the GA 2020 virtual series. Thank you all for joining us once again and um, I'd like to introduce our um, guest speaker for this evening's session, Dr. Kai Poller, who is the Assistant Professor at Texas A&M University and member of the Graduate Faculty of the Department of Animal Science. Um, Kai is joining us from um, Texas, as I said, in the US. So thank you, Kai, for getting up nice and early to join us. Um, Kai's research interests focus on the understanding the um, psychological and molecular mechanisms that control reprodu um, reproduction and efficiency in cattle. More specifically, his lab is interested in the mechanisms that lead to embryo, embryo, <laughs> embryonic and fetal um, mortality in cattle and development of um, management strategies to overcome these losses, well, which is what Kai will elaborate on during his presentation. There are a lot of big words in there, Kai, and I'm sure you've got a, bit, a lot of big words in your presentation. So I'll pass that on over to you and um, thank you for joining us once again. All right. Thanks a lot for that introduction. Can you hear me okay on your side? Absolutely. Okay, good deal. So the, the goal here, um, so I'm going to say a lot of times probably this morning, realizing that it's uh, 5 a.m. here in the morning in Cold Station, but one of the things that I, I want to visit about is really how can we increase fertility with a focus on decreasing pregnancy loss? One of the big areas that we work on is, is trying to understand pregnancy loss loss and development of management strategies for pregnancy loss. And so we're going to talk about really how can we de or increase fertility by decreasing uh, those losses in our cow herd. And, and I have these two pictures here on my first slide that represent uh, different things within the Department of Animal Science here at Texas A&M. So this symbol represents cattle adapted to tropical and subtropical environments. And this slide represents um, a group called Pregnancy and Developmental Programming. And really, you know, at Texas a and one of the, oops, let's see if I can get my slides to engage here. One of the big things that we're interested in is because about 70% of the cattle's population around the world, both beef and dairy, are located in tropical and subtropical based climates. And these lines are shifted down just a little bit on this slide, but I'm located right here uh, in College Station, Texas, which is in uh, Central Texas, and Juan Moreno from ST Genetics is about 15 miles away from me, and I know joined, uh, joined uh, everyone last week. But since about 70% of the cattle's population lie in these tropical and subtropical environments, one of the big emphasis that we have, and specifically that, that uh, my group is interested in, is how can we increase reproductive efficiency in cattle in these particular parts around the world? Because, you know, if you think about what some of the uh, heat aspects and heat stress aspects that you might experience in Australia, you know, it's going to be very different than, let's say, what a producer uh, in a more cold and temperate climate might be, be uh, dealing with. And so a lot of the things that we're focused on uh, are specifically around that. And a lot of the data that I'm going to show you today is specific to animals, both dairy and beef animals that are, are raised in tropical and subtropical climates. So, one of the things that I'll start out with is I one of as we've I've done a series of these webinars now in 2020 talking about different aspects of reproductive efficiency. One of the really important things I think that we all have to keep in mind um, because you know just as uh, a lot of you are producers, my family is uh, is are, are producers as well. We have to remember that there have to be realistic expectations for the goals that we put forth and, and how we're gonna manage our animals and what our expectations are from a, a pregnancy point of view, from a calving point of view, et cetera. So this timeline rep really represents what I call the critical aspects or the, the pivotal periods of pregnancy in cows. So as we go here early in gestation, obviously you're gonna have fertilization where sperm are gonna meet the, the female egg. You're going to undergo go early embryonic development till about day seven to get to this blastocyst stage. We all know um, people that deal in embryo transfer. This is obviously a structure that we deal with quite often. And then as we get past this, uh, we have this window called early embryonic or early, or early embryonic development and early embryonic mortality. So in fact, 
phase eight to 32 of gestation, really into the time that we can detect a pregnancy, either via blood-based pregnancy detection, ultrasound, palpation, these are all considered early embryonic loss periods. And so for the sake of the talk today, I'm gonna to talk about early embryonic loss as being this period of fertilization until about day 28 or 32 of gestation. Then as we move forward from here, we have this period of late embryonic or early fetal loss, which is these animals that we diagnose as pregnant in the barn um, are in the field and they don't actually go on to have a successful pregnancy. And you know, a lot of times there's a frustration with these animals because we either saw a visual pregnancy based on ultrasound, we palpated the pregnancy, we detected it with blood-based um, uh, pregnancy detection or milk-based pregnancy detection, but the animal loses the pregnancy. And as we think about it, either in a beef or dairy operation, these pregnancy losses cost us a lot of money because those cows go a lot of days with us believing that they're pregnant and they never actually are pregnant because they lose a pregnancy out here about day 45 or day 60. And we have to revert all the way back to the beginning to restart the process again. Now, the good news is in cattle, once we get past about day 45 or 60 of gestation, pregnancy loss really decreases both in beef and dairy animals. And what I wanted to point out is I, I have the dairy data and I have the beef data and I wanna show you both of them because at the end of the day, the periods of pregnancy loss are very similar between beef and dairy cows. The numbers differ slightly and the reasons and the stress at different points of gestation are different for the two uh, types of animals. And so I'm just gonna show you both of them then that way uh, that information is there and, and you can think about what it might mean um, back and forth. So when we look at dairy animals, this is fertility to a single service or a single artificial insemination. And if we go in and, and look at fertilization rate and ask the question, how many of the animals actually ovulate and we can recover our, um, yeah, we recover a embryo on day seven, what we find is that about 80% of the time fertilization has occurred in the lacking dairy cow. Now this range is quite wide, so anywhere from 50 to 90%, but the average is about 80%. So the point is that yes, there are some fertilization issues. There are some issues with getting those female gametes fertilized, but for the most part, fertilization is not the main limiting factor in the lacting dairy cow. Now, when we get out to day 28 of gestation, that first time that we can detect a pregnancy with ultrasound, there's a 30% loss that we characterize as early embryonic mortality. The, high, the idea has been that a lot of these pregnancies are failing to signal to the maternal environment or to the cow or mom, basically letting the, the animal know that an embryo is there. And so these animals are the ones that normally recycle back, all right, so they recycle back, we catch them in a, the next estrus, and we breed them off of that given cycle. Moving forward, the animals that we detect on day 28 that then go on to lose a pregnancy in the next couple weeks, this is a 12% loss in the lactating dairy cow, and we characterize this as late embryonic mortality. Now, as you increase the level of reproductive technology, if you add things like, um, like in vitro produced embryos, embryo transfer, this number is gonna get higher than 12%. I'm showing you the data here for actual AI. So then you have 38% of the animals pregnant on day, uh, day 42. And as we go forward from 42 to calving, there's very little pregnancy loss that's gonna occur. And so the, the thing to keep in mind is that once we get those animals to about day 45 or 60 in gestation, we're pretty safe to maintain them forward. Now, the, the, the area that I have surrounded by this black box is the area that we're very interested in, and, and it's the area that probably causes us a lot of financial issues when we look at these animals that are losing pregnancy during this time point. And so a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today are how to minimize loss in this specific window. I'm going to talk about some estrus data, I'm going to talk about some sire data, and talk about another very easy technique that can be used on the farm to hopefully help minimize this. Now I will stress, we have a very poor understanding of truly what causes this loss. And so think about it as this point as, we, we really don't know the root cause, we're trying to do things to help minimize this loss 
and basically put a Band-Aid on the situation until we fully understand all the factors that might be going into this, this, uh, this loss. But I'm gonna show you three that I think are really compelling today. Now, the other thing that we have to keep in mind is that as the technology gets better for pregnancy diagnosis with things like milk-based testing, blood-based testing, or advanced ultrasounding, one of the things that we're gonna find is we're gonna detect more cows pregnant. But for every day that you back up your pregnancy diagnosis, so if you go from a day 30 pregnancy diagnosis to a day 28 pregnancy diagnosis, what we're gonna do is we're gonna find more animals that are pregnant most likely. And because of that, we're gonna find more pregnancy loss moving forward in that time point than we would find in a traditional sense as if we did preg checks at day 32 or day 35 or whatever it might be. This is some data from a big herd that we work with in, in South America, um, in Brazil, where we look at pregnant animals on day 24 of gestation using a set of tests that, that we have, and then look at their pregnancy on day 31. And what we're finding is that about 10 to 20 percent of the time, the animals that are pregnant on day 24 are no longer pregnant at day 31. And I show you this because pregnancy loss can happen very rapidly, right? When we do a pregnancy check on an animal, we're in the barn that day, we palpate the animal. It just tells us whether that animal's pregnant on that given day or not. It doesn't really tell us anything about her pregnancy success moving forward. Although, you know, it's safe to say if an animal's pregnant, she has a high probability to be, be pregnant at the next pregnancy check. So this is in lactating dairy cows. This is some data in heifers. We've added a lot of data to this now um, and, and, you know, can definitely say that this happens in heifers as well. We have this both in dairy and beef heifers. These are heifers that are undergoing embryo transfer. It's the exact same idea as the slide before where we characterize animals that are pregnant on, on uh, day 20, day 31 based on a day 24 sample. We have the ones that are not pregnant, and then we have 11% of them that were diagnosed pregnant on day 24, but are no longer pregnant on day 31. And again, I just point this out because we have to take these, in, these factors into account as we think about management strategies, we think about when the loss is occurring and how we manage that. One of the things that I've continually seen increase um, as we've worked with uh, dairy animals in tropical and subtropical environments is we are seeing a lot of cows come to the preg check after an artificial insemination that have never shown heat, but are not pregnant at the preg check. And so right now we're trying to figure out, is that because of pregnancy loss? Is it because of a delayed luteolysis, a delay for that animal to re regress that corpus luteum, et cetera? These are all important questions that I think we need to address. Now on the beef side, we've done the exact same thing where I have these slides broken down a little bit different. This is the early embryonic mortality. And, and the data that I showed you in the slides before include a lot of animals. Uh, this data has 50,000 beef animals from around the world uh, located in it. And what I wanna point out is in animals that have high early embryonic mortality, you tend to see this higher in our primiparous cows versus our multiparous cows in our heifers. And, and these are number of studies, these ends right here, not number of animals. But one of the things that, that's probably critical specifically to people in Australia is what we have really been focused on is how the subspecies, whether you're talking about Indicus like Brahmin or, or Jeer or something like that, how does that affect pregnancy loss? And what we are finding is animals that have Bosinicus influence have higher pregnancy loss early in gestation compared to those that don't. And unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to go into all the story today, but that's something that, that needs to be kept in mind uh, specifically for people that are using those type of genetics. Also, I don't think it's any uh, surprise that as we get into things like fixed time AI and embryo transfer, you see higher pregnancy loss early in gestation from those techniques as well. Now on the late embryonic mortality side, again, this is beef, late embryonic mortality, where we're looking at from a preg check forward, there's no difference in the subspecies here. So this, the Indicus and Taurus animals lose pregnancy later in just in the, the 30 days after preg check uh, in the same way. One of the things that is very surprising, but very, very repeatable, and as we've gone back and looked at this now in a lot of our large data sets and, and big farms in Brazil, is that heifers, and I think this is critical for our dairy animals as well. So our heifers, our virgin heifers, 
are ha experiencing a lot more late embryonic mortality and pregnancy loss after a day 28 or day 30 preg check compared to any of our other age categories. And this is something that we're going to have to keep in mind and something that we're going to have to um, figure out better ways to manage. And, and hopefully some of the things I'm going to talk about today can help you in that area. Again, not surprising, embryo transfer has a hot, lot higher pregnancy loss after a day 30 preg check. If you get into in vitro fertilized embryos, this is even going to be higher, um, and, and we can maybe spend some time at the end talking about that if anybody has any questions. So I guess the big question that, that we focus on is, here is a pregnancy, a bovine pregnancy that's about day 28 to day 30 of gestation. Here's a pregnancy that's about day 60 of gestation. This is a 3D uh, image of a bovine fetus. And then we obviously have a calf on the ground. So this is the normal situation. So the question is, you know, how does all this happen normally? Why don't we have any problems? And then in some cases, why can we diagnose a pregnancy on day 28 or day 30? And then we go forward to not have a successful pregnancy and really, you know, disappointed as a producer, but also costing us a lot of money because we have this cow that essentially when she loses that pregnancy, we have to convert all those to days open at that point and think about her as being an open animal during that entire time point and not being pregnant during that entire time point. So this is the main area that my group focuses on. And what I wanna talk about is how can we minimize the loss? Okay, how can we minimize this type of thing from happening? And what are some of the management strategies that can go into that? And the first question is what controls pregnancy loss? And I'm really you know, on the fence about this because there's two options. There's either the female contributions or the male contributions. And I'm gonna talk about both of those today. I think there's strong indicators that both are really affecting this loss. And I think that makes sense, right, from a, a genetics point of view. But there might be opportunities to gain more advantages in one area versus the other to help minimize this type of loss. For a long time, we've thought that the, let's say the male has a big effect in the first three days of gestation because the sperm need to swim up the reproductive tract, they need to fertilize the, the oocyte. Um, but as we've gone forward, then we've thought that maybe the cow contributes more to pregnancy loss. And what I will tell you, I can't go into everything today because we don't have time, but I will tell you that maybe this isn't 100% correct. Maybe the male is affecting pregnancy loss in a much different way than what we think about versus the female. So I think we need to be open to our thoughts here and, and uh, some of the data I'm gonna show you from the male side will hint towards some of that. So management of pregnancy loss. I think that there's a lot of ways that we can decrease this loss from a management point of view. And I'm gonna talk about some of those factors that go into it. One of the big things that we've done and we've had a great relationship with, with Estratech here in the United States for uh, a number of years now working on a, a lot of projects in regards to trying to understand pregnancy loss. And one of the things that we've always done is we've used their product uh, to measure estrus intensity or get a measure of estrus around the time of AI. So most of the animals that we deal with is we're using a timed uh, artificial insemination protocol just because of the large herds that we're dealing with and wanting to breed everything on a given day. But within, when animals come in, we score everything at the time of AI based on their estrotech patch. So these estrotech patches are essentially a, a patch that goes on the top of the tail head of the cow. Uh, once cows or other animals mount uh, that, that um, individual animal when she's in estrus, that material scratches away. So we started scoring these patches, um, I guess about 10 years ago now, on a four point scale, where score one is where you have zero to 25% of the patch rubbed off. Score two is 25 to 50% of the patch. Score three is 50 to 75% of the patch. And score four is 75 to 100% of the patch. And if they lost the patch, the animal gets a zero. Now I'll tell you, we've put on thousands of these Estratech patches in every in environment that you can imagine. And our rate at which we lose patches is very low. Now we put them on properly and, and, and follow all the recommendations, but we don't have a big problem with patch loss. So we then come back and we basically say, okay, these animals have no or low estrus activity, and these animals have high 
uh, are, are basically animals that are standing in estrus. And so we started out scoring these and, and have done a lot um, looking at this scoring system. And we first started doing this is some dairy data out of Brazil with fixed time AI, where we have animals that had activated patches versus those that do not. And what you can see is the, the, the pregnancy rates at day 32 in the animals that had, uh, an est uh, had activated patches in threes and fours were higher than the ones that did not show estrus. The day 60 showed a similar trend. And what we also saw is that pregnancy loss was higher in the animals that did not show estrus in this specific situation based on the estrotank patch score. That's AI data. The same thing is true on an embryo transfer point of view. So when we're doing large embryo transfers in commercial dairies, a lot of times we're having a lot of animals that have ovulated or showed very little estrous activity, but we still need them for recipients. And, and so we do a lot of fixed time embryo transfer with in vitro produced embryos now. And what we see is the exact same trend animals that show estrus have higher pregnancy rates compared to the ones that don't show estrus and you see higher pregnancy loss in the ones that do not display estrus compared to the animals that do show estrus. Now keep in mind that these are all timed AI and timed embryo transfer protocols. So I'm not detecting estrus and breeding based on estrus or transferring embryos based on estrus. I'm going to the farm and executing these protocols on a given day to capture as many of the animals as possible to get bred during that specific time period. When we've looked at this over large sets of data and basically have gone through and looked at it in Brazil, so this is including beef and dairy data, and in the US in both beef and dairy data, what we have seen is that as patch score increases, as we increase the estric activity of those patches, where we go from, again, zero to 25% of the patch rubbed off compared to 100% of the patch rubbed off, you increase the pregnancy rates at day 30. In the U.S., we see a very similar trend from these animals that have low or no estrus activity compared to the ones that have a lot of estrus activity. So very repeatable over a large number of animals. Now, what we've also seen is that if we look at pregnancy loss, just like I showed you in the dairy data from Brazil on two slides before, pregnancy loss is higher in the animals that have these low patch scores of one and two or low estrus intensity compared to the animals in three and four. And so at this time, this is kind of what these patches would look like, is essentially you would have cows that didn't have an activated patch. They could establish a pregnancy because they ovulate, they just don't have very high estrus intensity, but they have a higher chance for pregnancy loss versus these animals here, they had high estrus intensity their patches were totally activated. They're, they're threes and fours. These are both fours in this case. They had a decrease in pregnancy loss. And so at this point, you know, we, we got together with Estratech and, and Boyd Dingus and the guys here in the U.S. And one of the things that was challenging out in the field is how do you make a decision whether this is a patch score of one, two, three, or four? These are obviously very easy, right? Because this is one that's not activated. This is one that's activated. So one of the things that we came up with is the possibility to, re, to, to work on the patch a little bit from a visual point of view and develop a patch that had a visual indicator that we could see when 50% of the patch had been activated. And so these are the patches that, that you'll see on the market today. Uh, these patches were launched at World Dairy Expo, I guess, um, almost uh, be two years ago in October. Um, so this is the Estrotec breeding indicator with the breeding bullseye here in the middle, where essentially this material, you can see as we move forward, is rubbed off first. And once you get to this patch here in the middle, the third one um, here in the middle, that represents getting into a patch score of three or four, versus the first two patches here represents patch scores of ones and twos. So it makes it easier from a visual observation point of view to be able to determine when you've reached that threshold level for estrus detection and when you're going to start to minimize pregnancy loss. So one of the other things that we do is we measure 
PAGs or pregnancy associated glycoproteins in the blood or in the milk and a lot of the animals that we work with. And the reason that we do that is, is because this is the basis for the commercial um, pregnancy test in cattle, either in milk or blood. And it's something that's very easy for us to quantify um, in our animals and in the lab. And one of the things that we have noticed and, and have used this for is we've been able to use this as a marker and predictor of pregnancy success. So as the concentration of this increases in the blood early in, ge in gestation, excuse me, you get an increase in pregnancy success. When we look at it from a pregnancy loss point of view, so here we have 100% pregnancy loss. As we get more of it in circulation, we decrease pregnancy loss to essentially 0%. So if I summarize this, uh, this data in these two slides in a very simple context and basically say more PAG early in gestation is a good thing, okay? We want that. We, we have a lot of data to show that that's a good thing. What we see is that as we increase estrotech patch score, okay, as we increase the amount of estrous activity in these animals, what we are seeing is we're seeing an increase in PAG concentration in the pregnancies in these patch scores of threes and fours. And it makes sense because these have a lower chance to experience pregnancy loss, okay? I have a lot of other data. This is some beef data here where we looked at the exact same thing. So you can see an increase in uh, patch scores as we see an increase in fertility at day 30. And you can see an increase in PAG in these later patch scores here. So the data holds true in basically both Boss Indicus and Boss Tara subspecies, holds true in beef and dairy, holds true what, we, what we've seen in heifers and cows. So there's a lot of positive aspects to show that this is indeed a repeatable trend. And, and I, I don't know, I would say we've probably put Estratech patches now on 50 to 60,000 animals just in my research program alone. It might be more than that. But there's a lot of these Estratech patches that are applied across the world every day. And it can allow for a precision measurement behind the animal in something that's very simple to look at at the time of AI or embryo transfer to help you from a management point of view and, and what, we, what, what are some different options that, that could be done. And I'll talk about that here in, in a couple slides. So again, if I come back to that data from the U.S. and Brazil, and I apply these new patches to what we've seen, this is essentially what we're seeing. So in these where we don't have the activated bullseye here in the middle or this uh, piece here in the middle, you're seeing decreased pregnancy rates versus when I get into an activated patch where the black part's been rubbed off, you're seeing increased pregnancy rates both in the data from Brazil and the United States. So what happens if I'm standing behind a cow? and she has a patch that has not been activated and it's the timed AI or in a timed AI protocol. So there's two options. So one option is you might be using sex semen versus not, okay? So if you, if you have the option to use both success, sex and conventional semen in your operation, one option would be in the animal that doesn't have an activated estrotech patch, breed her with conventional semen instead of using sex semen. The other obviously big trend that I'm sure Juan talked a lot about last week is if you're using beef semen, you know, you could use beef semen in a situation where you don't have an activated estrotech patch and use the sex or conventional dairy semen in a situation where you do. Same aspects go for a beef producer. You just apply whatever might be the more expensive straw of semen or more genetically valuable straw of semen to the animals that have an activated estrotech patch versus those that do not. Now, one of the big things that we've been focused on here recently is what is the variance in sire fertility? Okay, and, and I think this is critical if we want to minimize pregnancy loss. We have to do a better job on understanding sire fertility. In this graph, there is a approximately, I think, uh, 80,000 dairy records. Each of these bar graphs uh, combined together represent an individual sire where I have pregnancy rate and pregnancy loss data from each of these sires. And what I wanna point out is that pregnancy rate across the board is in maroon, and you can see it's kind of all over the place here. But if we look at pregnancy loss, pregnancy loss from a first preg check, a P1 at day 28 to day 32, and followed up by a P2, ranges from 6% to 37%. So quite variable. There's a lot of pregnancy loss differences as we look in these sires. And we can see this both in beef 
and dairy data. Here's the variance in sire fertility from very large data sets in Brazil. This is the number of AIs, okay, from across all these different locations. The average pregnancy rate is 50 something percent on average across all this data, so very acceptable. But look at the ranges in fertility. Down here, we have sires that have 22% pregnancy rates, and we have sires that have 81% pregnancy rates. If we want to increase fertility of our cow herd as a whole, one of the things that we have to do is we have to minimize sire fertility variance. The more variance that we have coming in from sire fertility is obviously really going to affect the variance of our cow herd fertility and as a whole bring that average down. So the question is how much of this sire fertility can affect pregnancy loss? I showed you the data in dairy in the slide before right here and you can see there's definitely sires in this case that have very high pregnancy rates so 60 percent pregnancy rates to a p1 but yet this sire has a 25 percent pregnancy loss so 25 percent of his pregnancies don't make it from a p1 to a p2 well that's something that's definitely not good right so if you take a sire that has a similar pregnancy rate back here at, let's say, 55%, and he has a pregnancy loss of 10% from P1 to P2, that's a lot more tolerable. So we need to be able to identify and eliminate these sires in order to maximize our cow herd fertility. So this is, this is also uh, dealing with the sire side of things versus let's thinking about a convention versus sex, uh, sex semen-based approach. This is what I was talking about earlier. So these are animals that have an activated estrotech patch that have been bred with conventional or sex semen. And you can see not a big difference here in this case, um, both above 55% for pregnancy rates. But if we get here in the estrus response where they don't have an activated estrotech patch, you can see pregnancy rates not only decrease in the conventional, but they drastically decrease in the sex semen product. So something to keep in mind as we manage those animals and, and how we manage a, for a yes or no estrotech patch score. The other thing I want to point out is sires differ in how we classify them. One of the big things that we're seeing is we can find sires that have high pregnancy loss early in gestation from day zero to day 31, which I'm going to characterize as early embryonic loss. We have sires that have high pregnancy loss from day 31 to day 60, like I showed you in those dairy sires. This is late embryonic loss. As we look at these, I, I don't want this, I'm not gonna go through this slide, but the bad news for us as producers and people that work in trying to understand fertility is these sires don't stay in the same categories. So just because a sire has high or low early pregnancy loss in those first 30 days, doesn't mean that he's gonna have high or low pregnancy loss in the next 30 days, which is a major challenge, right? So the phenotypes that we're collecting in the field, the phenotypes that we're collecting in the field are critical to understanding and getting a better idea of pregnancy loss, specifically in the dairy side of things. And so we have a big project undergoing uh, right now in the U.S. with, with uh, Holsteins, uh, characterizing really strict phenotypes and taking a look and evaluating SCR and DPR to figure out um, how good those phenotypes are and what they mean in the field. So looking at these pregnancy loss and pregnancy rates by sire and taking into account estrus activity. So in these situations, I have animals that don't have, so the cows either had a activated estrotech patch or did not have an ex activated estrotech breeding indicator. And what we can see as we go across here, in all cases, when the cows had a positive estrotech breeding indicator, the sires performed better, which I think makes sense. Now we can find situations where there's not a big difference in how a sire performs, whether the animal was in heat or not, but for the most part it does. The other thing is if we look at the high embryonic, late embryonic mortality sires versus the low, the other thing I wanna point out is that the animals, the pregnancy loss is always decreased when the animals have estrus activity or have an activated patch, okay? Even when you include the sire into that specific analysis. This is also some data. This is the first indication 
that we saw this. This is a big beef project that we did um, with about 2,000 animals in South America where we had Bostaris Angus bulls and we had Boston to Kisnalori bulls or, or, or similar to the Brahmin breed. Where we looked at animals when they were in estrus, there was no difference in pregnancy rate as you went across here. But when we looked at animals that were not in estrus, what we found is that the Boss Indicus bulls were performing superior. They had no decrease in fertility compared to when the cows were in estrus versus not in estrus. And so this goes into that idea of what might be affecting uh, this subspecies of Boss Indicus versus Boss Taurus and how that might play in and how a tropical and subtropical environment might be affecting that. So again, um, if I take all that data together in those first few slides with estrus, remember estrus is all, not only affecting the cow side, but we're also seeing male aspects showing up there. Now, the last thing I'll talk about here with estrus is we've just published a paper uh, with some colleagues in Canada where, where we did a set of projects um, in, in Brazil with uh, Holst Holstein animals in Brazil. And what we found is that animals that had, so these are embryo donors, these are Holstein heifers, okay, Holstein heifers that were donors. What we found is when the donors had activated, fully activated estrotec breeding indicators, they had increased number of follicles at the time of AI when we ovulated them. They had an increased percentage of viable embryos and they had increased number of viable embryos that we froze. So a lot of times we, we think about, I'm just showing you this on the embryo side because we think about, well, it's important for a donor to show estrus, but the level might not be that important. Well, in this data, at least in Holstein heifer donors, that seems to be pretty, pretty critical. And so this was just published in Journal of Dairy Science uh, showing that. The last thing that I'll point out is another management technique to decrease pregnancy loss. What we've recently been doing and, and have uh, been using a lot in the field in lactating dairy cows is giving the reproductive tract a size and position score. So if the tract is on the above the pelvic floor and everything is up uh, quite nicely here on the top of the pelvis, we give them a one. If the cervix is up, but the two, the horns are hanging down, we give it a two. And if everything's hanging over the, the floor of the pelvis, uh, we give it a three. And for people that breed a lot of cows and palpate a lot of cows, this would be something that is very easy for you to identify. And probably mentally, you're already taking note of this when, when you're breeding or ultrasounding the cows to begin with. We assign these scores at the time of artificial insemination or embryo transfer. And what we have found is that if we look at pregnancy per AI, these cows that have smaller tract scores, independent of parity, okay, obviously larger tracts are showing up more in multi pairs cows, but these data are independent of parity, that these smaller tracts lead to increased pregnancy rates and decreased pregnancy loss compared to these larger tracts. So this is a set of data that's already been published uh, in Holstein cows here in the US. And this is a set of data in Holsteins uh, in Brazil, where basically we have seen the exact same thing. So, you know, the, the question is, well, how do you deal with a cow that has low estrus activity in a big reproductive tract? You know, probably you're not going to want to put the most expensive straw of semen that you have in that individual animal. You're probably going to want to use something that's a little bit cheaper or of less genetic merit uh, for what you're interested in. Now, in summary, so we have, I want to take, you have plenty of time for questions. I've kind of gone through a lot of data here, but the main thing I want to point out is, you know, the Estrotec uh, breeding indicator is something that came out of a lot of research that we've done that's, that's backed up by a lot of data, but it's a very simple tool. It's a very simple patch that goes on the back of the animal, but something that can give us a lot of data. If we think about how it affects not only fertility from the cow side, but you put the male aspect into it and you start to add all these things, you can really make management decisions behind the animal when you're working on the farm to be able to execute what might be taking place and, and, and to minimize pregnancy loss and also keep in mind what those realistic numbers behind pregnancy loss might be. So the big story is, as we increase the estrus activity in our cow herd, you know, we're going to increase pregnancy rate. But I have this day 60 pregnancy here, this 3D pregnancy here, because we're going to decrease pregnancy loss. And I think that from a production point of view, one of the big things that we have to do is figure out ways to decrease pregnancy loss to increase our overall fertility. And I think that that's something that, that's uh, gonna be critical. 
So with that, um, this is my lab group here and, and everybody that's, uh, that helps us out. So um, a lot of my Brazilian colleagues are included in this picture. A lot of our funding sources uh, here that, that have been generous in providing us support over the years. And then the last thing that I wanna point out is here at Texas A&M, one of the programs that we offer um, that is more focused toward beef is a program called the 44 Farms International Beef Academy. Um, and so this program was launched two years ago. It's a year long on online curriculum. Uh, everything's totally online, which is obviously important uh, in the current time. It's a certificate based program to basically cover all the cutting edge technology across beef production. Um, both from reproductive technology all the way to nutrition. Uh, and so if you have an interest in that, I encourage you to visit the Texas A&M Animal Science website and, and take a look at that. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. So thanks, thanks for having me on, it's been great. Thank you so much, Kai. Um, one question I've got to start us off is, um, just in relation to um, the genetic improvement that we're seeing around the world these days, um, have you seen any, um, any impact in your research over the last few years as, as the world improves in its genetics, especially around fertility? Yeah, so I think obviously genetics is very powerful, right? And has really helped us from a number of aspects as we look at um, overall production. One of the things that, that we are really focused on right now is the measures of fertility that are currently available from a genetic point of view. How well do those correlate with the phenotypes that we're seeing out in the field? And so I'm gonna flip back here just a couple slides because this is a really big question I'm sure uh, a lot of dairy producers that are on today looking at this dairy data and, and sire fertility would like to see what are the correlated SCR values um, that might be going along with these individual sires. And I, I purposely didn't include those this morning, but one of the things that we're looking at is how do those correlate? Because if, so at the end of the day, when you take pregnancy rate and you subtract out, subtract out pregnancy loss, that's the cows that obviously go on to calve. And so what we wanna do is see, is SCR related to those animals that have the highest percentage of that? Well, I think what we're finding is, is that fertility phenotypes are very difficult to characterize in the field because everybody has a different, different definition of what fertility means. Some people might say that fertility means that a cow gets pregnant at day 30 to a P1. Some might say she's pregnant at a P2. Some might say, you know, she needs to calve, whatever that might be. And so, yes, we've made a lot of gain. Um, and I think that it's been, it's really helped uh, to minimize a lot of problematic issues on the, si on the fertility side. But I think there's a lot of room to improve the accuracy um, of the system by generating or, or, or collecting uh, better phenotypes. Awesome. Thanks, Kai. Um, another question's popped up. Um, do you think there is any advantage um, in regards to ovulation or conception using GNRH? Yeah. So m all the projects that I talked about today, um, definitely we're using GNRH to, to ovulate uh, cows at the end of protocols. Now, that's not to mean that we're not breeding cows when they come back into estrus, but as we you know, specifically in big operations, um, try to move for animals forward. We're using a lot of GNRH um, in those ovulation protocols. And, and that's why when you see the data that I show, you know, we have animals that don't show estrus and, and can get pregnant, right? Um, that's because with the GNRH, they are going on uh, to ovulate. Uh, and in that case, that low or no estrus activity event is definitely affecting their ability to maintain a pregnancy. So, you know, it's a, it's a balancing act, right, into sort of how you manage and, and what protocols you use. And, and I, one thing that I normally say, and I, I should have included is, the reproductive management program that you pick for either your dairy or beef operation is something that needs to work well for your operation. 
just because the dairy down the road or the beef producer down the road is using that, that program or that technique doesn't mean that it might work well for you. It has to be something that fits your management strategy, that has to fit your, your ability of your farm uh, to, to fit into the operation. If you try to take a program that works, let's say at, a, at some other dairy or some other operation and stick it onto yours and force it to work, it might not work as well as if you had picked a program that better fit your operation. So time AI is gonna work in some cases for some people, estrogen detection is gonna work better for some other people. So it's just sort of dependent on uh, what, what might work in, in your operation. But the GNRH has a, a lot of advantages to be able to get animals to ovulate, yes indeed. Yeah, and that's probably a, um, a fantastic point to um, also mention our speaker for next week, um, which is Sophia Edwards from Vetiquinol. Um, we'll actually touch on a lot of those um, fixed time AI and protocols and procedures. So definitely anyone interested in that should um, jump on for next week. Um, another couple of questions that have popped up, Kai. Um, uh, have you, obviously a lot of your studies tonight were on um, fixed time AI. Have you got much data in relation to um, natural matings? Yeah, so we have some natural matings in um, in beef uh, and have done a, so let me back up. What we've been trying to do is to understand the sire influence to pregnancy loss. And so we've, we've generated sire lines that we know have backgrounds of high and low pregnancy loss. And then we've made um, breeding bulls out of them and, and have moved them into the field now to assess them on a natural service point of view. And, and I think that specifically from a, a understanding of reproductive biology and reproductive physiology, there's a lot to still learn about the sire and, and specifically in the natural service thing or natural service situation. It seems that efficiency as a whole, when you move into natural service, um, increases a lot because the bull has an ability by detecting pheromones and, and other uh, natural sensing to uh, almost uh, overcome a lot of these aspects. But the problem with the bull is he doesn't take very good notes, right? He doesn't write down uh, who he's breeding, who he's not breeding, those type of aspects. So there is that part of it. But one thing that I would point out and, and remind people of is there's also a trade-off there. So you have a, um, a natural service sire that probably doesn't have the same genetic merit as a, as a sire that's being collected in a uh, sire collection facility. So you have to trade off sort of genetics versus, for, versus uh, natural service and, and think about those things in regards to what they mean in overall efficiency. Um, another question that's popped up, Kai, um, in ET work, does the estrus patch score in a recip correlate with the quality of the corpus luteum in that recip? Good question, yeah. So we have undertaken a lot of projects trying to evaluate the corpus luteum for determining which animals to transfer into and which animals to not transfer into. Um, there is data using uh, what's called Doppler uh, blood perfusion technology, which is a way to, you ultrasound the CL, you determine how much blood flow is there, which correlates with um, the, the potential quality of that corpus luteum. And there's some data to show that that definitely leads to an increase in, um, in fertility and in ET programs. What 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 I tend to see in the animals that we work with is, so I ultrasound every recipient, look at her CL, um, and I also palpate them just rectally and palpate the CL. And maybe it's just the way that I learned to do in brood transfer, but what, what I tend to see is that in animals that I palpate a, a good corpus luteum and I feel confident in the corpus luteum when I do the transfer, I tend to um, see the exact same thing on ultrasound. The animals that I, I palpate that may have a questionable CL or a smaller CL, when I, when I pass the ultrasound and look at it on ultrasound, it, it basically confirms what I think, that it's a smaller CL or whatever it might be. But, you know, what does that really mean in regards to fertility? I would say it, it, there's maybe a slight decrease in, in those animals that have those type of CLs, but 
and the really large data sets, the animals that show estrus um, basically are the ones that end up getting pregnant embryo transfer independent of what their CL size is. Thanks, Kai. Um, another question that's come through. In our seasonal batch calving herds, the late embryotic mortality is far more damaging than early embryotic mortality, as they often miss another opportunity within the joining period. Is there potential in systems like ours to identify and avoid late embryonic mortality sires? Yeah, this is, that's exactly uh, the, the point. I mean, if you, the cost of late embryonic mortality in a seasonal herd is, is devastating because the cow doesn't get rebred, right? I mean, she, she's gonna get cold. Um, and so what I think, you know, you, you have to implement in, in these seasonal herds is you have to do early pregnancy diagnosis and you have to do a follow-up preg check quickly. Um, and I think resynchronization has a lot of opportunity in seasonal aspects. The other thing, so from what our goal is, is over time is that we can basically generate genetic tools to screen sires that have low pregnancy loss, right? So that would be an opportunity. The other thing is from a, a seasonal breeding point of view, what I would you know, encourage you to do is to, to try to put every management aspect in place to decrease that loss. So if you can move that loss from, let's say, 10% to 4%, that's a huge win. Uh, we're never going to get it to zero, right? I mean, it's just that um, biology is very complicated. Just when we think we have everything under control, uh, something else, you know, pops up. And so I think that minimizing it to the best of our ability is going to be uh, where our focus is. And what I would also encourage you to do is as you have situations and what, what I see here in the U.S. is we have specifically on the beef side, we have fall and spring seasons, right? So beef producers a lot of times have both cow herds. If a cow doesn't conceive or loses a pregnancy in the fall, she automatically moves to the spring, which I think is a bad idea. If an animal loses a pregnancy, the best thing you can do is call her out of your herd and, and you know, follow that that genetic family to see if you have other aspects taking place. Awesome. I've got a fair few questions coming through, but unfortunately we kind of want to be a bit cautious of time. So we'll have um, just one more question and I can also send some of these questions through to Kai um, following the presentation. Um, one that's just popped up, um, are there studies in the effectiveness of activity meters um, in maintaining a viable pregnancy? Yeah, so one of my very close colleagues, uh, Ronaldo Sehi, that is at um, University of British Columbia in Canada, has done a lot of basically the exact same projects that we've done with uh, Estratec patches and using accelerometers. And yes, the as you increase estrus intensity, in an accelerometer-based system, you increase fertility and decrease pregnancy loss. Um, and so, you know, in those situations, the the only the challenges of them are, you know, you you have a a, a little bit different technology um, that you're you're indirectly measuring uh, estrus intensity by steps and not by actual mounting activity. So you're going to decrease the the accuracy to just slightly there. Um, but yes, that data is there. And, and I would say that the data there is in a number of ways to show that estrus intensity is important, not just um, with pedometers or accelerometers or patches. There's a lot of historical data to show that that's, that it's critical. Kai, um, we've got a few questions in regards to um, using Estratech with um, collar systems or, um, or other heat detection. Um, so I'm just going to kind of merge some of those together. Um, when testing Estratex on the one to four system, have you done any comparisons to electric heat detection aids such as collars and, and leg bands and compared preg data um, as to which system will give you the best results in long-term joining and the accuracy of the heat that they are joined on? Yeah. So, that's a you know a really really good question and yes we have it just it depends how you so are if you use the raw data from the pedometers or the accelerometers are you actually using the the thresholds for the animal that 
actually showed up on the breeding list. What we've done is, so, you know, we've taken the raw data and looked at correlations between the raw data and basically an, a, a patch-based um, event, and those definitely correlate. It's really hard to determine inaccuracy because in order to determine an accuracy, you have to have a gold standard of an animal um, visually being an estrus, right? Well, if the patch score is a four, we know the animal has visually been an estrus. So the accuracies are a little bit hard to calculate. I will say, I will just say that they're strongly correlated um, and that I would have confidence in, um, in, you know, in comparing those to each other. Perfect. I think we will finish up there, Kai. Um, thank you again so much for joining us. As I mentioned, there are a few other questions that we didn't quite get to this evening, but I'll shoot them through to you and we can get back to those people specifically. Um, next week, as I mentioned, we are going to be joined by um, Dr. Sophia Edwards, who's a business unit manager for Vetiquinol in Australia and also in New Zealand. Um, and perfect um, lead on from tonight's session. Sophia will be discussing um, the, the word of reproduction and um, going into fixed time AI and um, particularly protocols and procedures um, to make sure that, that you're getting the right, um, the right protocol and procedure as we highlighted this evening. That's such an important, um, important thing to get right. So thank you again, Kai, so much for joining us. It's obviously quite an Thanks early for start me. for you, um, start for you over in Texas. And um, yeah, it'd be great to, um, when, when the world allows, you can come over to Australia and we look, yeah, certainly look forward to catching up with yourself and also Boyd, the head man at Estrotech. We'll um, yeah, look forward to catching up with you guys then. Thanks. So in the interim, everyone, thank you so much again for joining us this evening um, and I hope you keep safe and well and we will see you all again next week. Thank you and good night.